Hello, Jay. Uh, congratulations on the film. I really enjoyed the film. I really enjoyed the film. It's a great action. It takes you straight in there. And all apparently done in one shot. Is that right? Is it in one shot? Um, well, if I tell you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, seeing as we both share former occupations, I'm, I'm going to suggest that it's kind of made up of more than one shot. But uh, that aside... I would shoot. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah, very not. clever edit points in it, it's got to be said. But what I was uh, going to ask you is, what was the thing that... Uh, I mean, it is so impressively done, especially that that first 25 minutes, which is absolutely frenetic action. Um, what was the thing that kind of went sort of would just ruin a take for you time and again? Good question. Um, OK, so for those of your I'm sure most of your followers know, but we obviously we made one shot the first movie um, a couple of years ago. So we'd had a little bit of experience when we went into one more shot knowing kind of like the parameters of how to kind of make this movie um so the only thing that really stressed us out about the sequel more so than the original was that we decided to shoot in a in a fully working you know international airport you know like the uk's fourth biggest airport or something like that so that was kind of the most demanding challenging part of the shoot just trying to shoot a film not just a normal film but an action film with guns and explosions but also not just a normal film because you know coming coming across a seemingly one take but that that obviously requires doing takes at sort of six to ten minutes in length Jim, yeah. you know uh and doing it you know during operational hours of a working airport so the most stressful thing about this movie um <laughs> was that the, was just the, the working airport nature of all of this. And what we normally do at an airport is there's the, the flight regulation time. So they sort of stop flights from midnight till 4 a.m. so that the public can all get to sleep and there's not like planes going over there. So we, we kind of shot most of the movie between midnight and 4 a.m. Uh, and any other time was just used to kind of rehearse or shepherd people out of the way. I was going to say, because, I mean, obviously, you know, you're doing night shoots in a, you know, working between 12 and 4 or shooting between 12 and 4, not the most social of hours, as anyone who's worked in film will know. But um, you, you're working in a, a real airport. You've got explosions. You've got firearms. Uh, just getting that level of authorization must have been an absolute nightmare in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're you're naive and excited when you're a filmmaker and a creative and you you kind of just yeah let's do it it'll be fine don't worry about it and then you know as as the shoot goes on as it gets closer you kind of start to realize oh there's all these regulations on badges I have a pass for five days if you're only working for two days you have to wait seven more days before you can have a pass to work again and all this logistical stuff like, they treat you like you're going to a different country which generally most people know what that's like you have to go through the big metal detector you have to take your shoes off you have to take your jacket off you have to take your bag off and um it's exactly the same for all members of staff going through an airport even the pilot you know there's no special dis dispensation for a film crew anything like that it's it would take us an hour to go through um so we'd all kind of go in stages and, and uh yeah, and it was just done. So fortunately, they did let us use the staff channel. Yeah, um, but you know, there'd still be this hour-long queues. So it was very. It was flip side to what we what we've what we've achieved. Hopefully, you felt this when you watched the movie, or if you haven't seen the movie, when you do watch the movie, is that you know the movie looks far greater than the sum of its parts because we're in an incredible location, and. You know, there's a reason that not not many movies are shot entirely at the airport, and that is because it's very difficult. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, we kind of stand out in a weird way because we did shoot at an airport because we look kind of different from a lot. Have to kind of fake it, whereas we, you know, you look out of any window and there was always a plane on the tarmac. So it's just production value was so. Well. So. I, I mean, the action is so good in it, especially that first half hour. It's just relentless. It's so well done. Um, choreographing all of that must have been a, a nightmare, both for yourself, for your ADs, 
for your production assistance and you're a low budget and you're in a high uh, high security area as well. How do you go about doing that? Yeah, great question. I mean, I'm I'm going grey. Uh, if I'm sure, if someone if someone <laughs> the press years ago when we did one shot, I'm sure if you did a side by side, I'm like got alopecia and I'm going grey, and you know, um, dead, the shots took taken upon myself and the producers and the crew. And this one was was up resed. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we approached we approached it the best way we with pre with the the little pre production. You know, we'd work out the. We, it was written. The script was written around the location. So once we, we had a, a ten page treatment for what we wanted to do with the movie, and then we were like, well, before we commit to an airport, let's make sure we can actually find one to shoot in. Yeah. And it took you know a few months of recceing, but we found Stansted Airport, London, UK, which is where we shot the movie. And then, uh, between myself and the producer and the writer, we worked out a kind of path that we thought would be cinematically interesting and yeah. then kind of molded that story around that path. And then with every kind of revisit and every re sort of draft and version of the script, we'd get closer and closer to honing the specific path. And then you start introducing your, you know, your teams and your technical crews to that. So we wouldn't be able to rehearse a fight scene in the airport, of course, because, um, everyone getting on the flight to Marbella would be like, what's going on? <laughs> yes. uh, so we did ended up... The flight. Yeah, they did happen. <laughs> you know, there's nothing sadder than watching people have to get off a plane because they missed takeoff and then have to go and sit outside WH Smith. And <laughs> we, you'd just be like, oh, no, please. Um, but, yeah, so we... Um, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, so basically, in, as, instead, I suppose what we do is we were staying at a hotel nearby and, you know, I'd have the dimensions of the area that we were going to fight in and we made that area out of cardboard boxes, for example. And then yeah. the rehearsals between the fight choreographer, the stunt choreographer, the actors, myself could all be contained in like a conference room so that once we had worked out how we were going to do it, then we could just like translate that into the airport itself. And it was a lot of that from not just the fight stuff, but also the dialogue stuff, yeah. um, you know, work it out in those rooms and then take it there. And then basically you just got sort of airdropped into the airport, if you pardon the pun, and you'd have an hour or two to rehearse it. And then, then you basically need to start shooting it and crack on because otherwise the day was just going to disappear. How, how many takes generally were you doing for each pass? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, less than the first movie. So first movie, we had an abandoned air, RAF airbase, which we could shoot in for, you know, 11 hours a day. So mm -hmm. and now I'm shooting in a working airport for four hours of that day. It's literally a third of the time. So it, and it did qualify to about a third of oh, the time. Right. So on the, on movie one, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'd get up to kind of like early 20s of a take. Yeah. You know, and you could bet that, you know, we'd end up using between take 20 and take 23. And then on this particular movie, we probably ended up getting between eight and 12 takes. I oh, mean, right. but equally we were under such stress and parameters by the airport on, on this movie that there's one particular nine minute sequence and we only got two takes of it. And the second oh, take right. is the one we used. So it just was, we got, we, we also got a lot more ambitious with the, with the lighting on this movie. The first movie set in daylight and this one's set at yeah. night with lighting and yeah. lighting took up a lot more time as well so it's kind of like not only do we have less time to shoot we also had more lights to put in and you know more action more guns all the cut we kind of responded to notes that we got on the first movie to try and be anti and um yeah so everything <laughs> <laughs> so there's one shot in this uh particularly i wanted to ask you about it's about halfway two-thirds of the way through and it's with scott and you're kind of on a like a first level and he gets thrown over uh, like a, a handrail uh, down towards a, an escalator. And obviously it's all in one shot and he goes over, he disappears then out of sight. And then the camera moves in and looks down and there he is at the bottom of the uh, moving uh, um, uh, escalator. And it kind of, you know, and I just wondered how that was done because... <laughs> it's yeah i'm just wondering how that was done it's a great is question that Scott? 
that is Scott. Scott did it. Scott did. Scott does all his own stunts. Didn't we? Don't double Scott at all. In fact, nobody. No, the only person who did any double work in the movie was um, Tom Berenger. Had a double for a day. Yeah. Do some running in the distance, and that was that wasn't because Tom didn't want to do it. It was just because we wanted to save Tom's energy and strength for the serious yeah. stuff, as opposed to having him run past in the background. So. Um, no, all, every actor in the movie is playing himself. Uh, and yes, Scott, Scott went over the rail. I only <laughs> ask about that particular scene because when the camera's then looking down at him uh, and he's done that fall, his head looks precariously close to having smashed into that as escalator rail. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't want to tell you all our trade secrets. Uh, and it's funny because you're the very first interview I've done. And this is the first time I've been asked this question. I'm I'm sort of rallying in my head. What do I, how do, do I tell you exactly how we did it? Um, go on, go on, tell me. I, I need to model that one. I can tell you he was very safe. The way right. we did it was very, very safe. And he, he, um, he did it twice and he wasn't at all hurt. And we would never put him in actual danger uh, where that, where he could get hurt. So um, there's some trick going on there, but um I'll tell you on the next. I'll tell you on the last, uh, the, the the final chapter of the movie. Maybe we go back. And talk, right. Okay. Okay. I'll ask you the <laughs> third one then. So, well, leading on from that, then of the whole film, uh, which is so involved uh, from a chore choreography point of view, what was the most difficult shot to achieve in all of it? Ooh. Well, you you have. It's so funny because the reason things can be difficult can be the most mundane reason, um, as opposed to something you think is like ultra complex, like yeah. the fall you just described. Like I'm super proud of that shot and what we did and we achieved, but like it wasn't it wasn't as difficult as operating out on the tarmac, for example, like being around the actual plane. So there are scenes in the movie where we're using the small road system of the airport, and we're also using um the apron which is where they kind of store the planes yeah. and the permissions to be in those areas are um, like overwhelming um because they are fully working all the time just because the planes aren't taking off there's baggage handlers driving around moving crates move getting the planes ready that they're like because the plane the planes frost and we shot the movie in january and february february of last year so about yeah. just just shy of a year ago the planes will freeze overnight so they have to constantly go around and like spray this antifreeze um so you're constantly dealing with all these these things and it's like the shot itself might be really simple just a walking shot but just the trying to control them like a mile's worth of changeable scenery um yeah. was extremely difficult so that on a like locate on a sort of geography based location restriction that was very difficult um but then similarly the shot i mentioned where we got two goes at it and it was like an eight minute ten minute take um that an hour before they, they we got there we were shooting it thought we had four hours someone came up and go oh no we're gonna turn the lights on in in, in an hour so we lost an hour all of a sudden yeah because part of the airport wakes up for anyone else wakes up and and no one had some techies and had conversations with everyone about it like from for a month before you know just on the day someone's like no i'm turning the lights on in in, in 20 minutes and then you're like oh god well we better we better get this shot so yeah. it was it's the kind of unpredictable stuff that really catches you out yeah so uh with all of this going on um who <laughs> who sustained the worst injuries was it the cast or was it the crew well, nobody, nobody actually got injured. Um, uh, so I can just imagine with the cameraman kind of going around, sort of. I, feel, I tell you, behind. nobody got injured, but there is a there is a fight in the movie where Scott throws one of the. He has a nice big fight with. Um, I'll just say the name. He has a really nice big fight with Teddy Leonard, great actor, plays yeah. um, Campbell in the movie. Yeah, and they have a they have a, like a, a a one on one, and it's in a corridor near uh near where you board the plane and scott th th throws him into the wall and as scott throws him into the wall 
this plasterboard and he actually goes in through the wall. Oh, I know the shot, yeah. And that was totally unplanned. We were not supposed to do that. Um, we got in trouble for doing that. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> um, and Scott, I spoke to Scott a lot. Like, I was going to say, oh, shit. Because then that fight goes on for about another minute and a half. Yeah. Um, and no cuts. They actually are doing it. And he went into that plasterboard and I thought, oh, shit. Like, and nobody said car. And the boys, they just switched in the head. I thought they just, I think they both just thought, well, we, but we're not getting another go at this, so we better go for it. Oh, right. And they really, they just went for it. And then um, the shot kind of was successful. Everything happened. And I looked to my producer and my producer said, well, you, you know, he stood up swearing. Went, well, you're not getting another effing go at this, are you? <laughs> and, um, and then I went up to Scott and I said, Scott, you threw him into the wall. And he went, yeah, I know. He said, I threw him into the wall. And then I thought, we're only going to get one go at this. So I'm just going to fucking go for it. And I thought, fair play. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so they, 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 that was real. But they know Teddy didn't get hurt at all you know and and i think he's grateful for the fact that the fight actually they actually went for it after that really a, a little bit probably a little bit harder than a rehearsal so so um my penultimate question and is uh leading on from the fights actually is that obviously you have uh scott and michael j white uh go uh you know mano a mano with one another they've worked together before but um i'm wondering because you know they are experts in their field are they just left alone to choreograph their own fight well, I have a fantastic fight choreographer called Tim Mann, who I've actually made four movies with now. And he's certainly like my right hand uh, when it comes to, um, you know, blocking and plotting a fight. Uh, I wouldn't want to do it with anyone else at this stage. Um, he, I was introduced to him through Scott for the movie Eliminators about mm -hmm. eight years ago. And um, because Scott likes to work with him because they do have a collaborative edge. You're correct. Yeah. Um, and I know that Tim has worked with Michael on, um, I think, at least Triple Threat. I'm not not sure what other movies, but at least one or three movies. So that so that we're a bit of a family, really, in that we all kind of know each other a little bit. So there's certainly, I would say, a lot of the fight voice does come from Tim. But then equally, Scott will, Scott knows what he can do and Michael knows what he can do. And if they do or don't want to do something, they'll say and then we'll find a workaround in the same way that I'll come in and I'll go, oh, can you just punch it up a bit? Or can you dial back and get a bit more drama in this bit? You know, it's a bit yeah. too much. So I'd say between the four of us and then also my stunt choreographer, um, Dan Stiles, who again made about six movies with, um, he comes in and kind of sets the safety of it all with props, et cetera. And then, and then at the very kind of the final stage before we kind of start shooting and getting camera involved in the blocking is it goes through my military coordinator, um tactics tom well tom lee i call him tactics tom um and he will sort of go oh you know like that's a bit hollywood we just we wouldn't do that in the military you know so he might then take some stuff out that feels a bit too flash yeah uh, and then camera comes in and we will kind of like figure out you know together where the camera should be and what what kind of dynamism we can add to it um so it's a process it's not just like one guy it really is a team effort and um you know I, I like to say that I should champion my team I've got a very good team I'm very happy with uh, um you know uh, it's certainly not just coming from my brain I'm working with geniuses so. so one last quick question um if I relate these to like the Die Hard films the first film you've got a building the second film is in an airport the third film for Die Hard would have been on a ship if it hadn't been for Under Siege. So is your third film going to be on a ship? <laughs> um, maybe. <laughs> no, I take, I've got a, I've got a location in mind, um, what I, which I would like to shoot the movie in. I think we're going to see, I'll obviously see how the movie, the movie comes out this Friday, the 12th in the UK and the 16th in the USA um i'm gonna i'm going to i do read the reviews i do read people's notes um please don't be brutal <laughs> <laughs> uh, no i don't mind i'm used to it but i i do read to kind of see what we can punch up and punch and improve and one of the you know one of the things i always wanted for this franchise you know because I, I wrote the original uh, well jamie russell actually wrote screenplays for both but i came up with the original concepts myself and one thing that I always wanted was to make a kind of computer game movie. 
And that is the way I look at these movies. I look at them like they're levels of a computer game. You know, if you play Metal Gear Solid or Call of Duty, it's like, right, now I'm at the Russian Gulag level. Now I'm in the airport level. You know, now I'm in the tundra. Now I'm on the ship. You know, now I'm on the oil rig. And, you know, one thing that I want, the you know, I desperately would love to make a third one. Uh, that's no secret. I think if you've seen the end of the second one, you can probably feel that. Yeah, um, yeah. And I do want the three movies to have their own color palette. You know, we've got this greeny, cold first movie. We've got this really steely, glassy metal second movie. And then the third movie is going to have its own individual level as well. So that's a hint to perhaps, you know, you can you can think about. That's great. Thank you ever so much for your time, James. It's very much appreciated.